Praise the Lord. I like uh, how God directed the study tonight. I was going to study one thing, and God said study another thing. And I liked it better than the first thing. That's how your birth is supposed to be. Your first birth is supposed to be okay. Second birth is supposed to be out of this world. And it will be. Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 4. Turn there. Like I said, it's, uh, snow's coming down pretty, pretty hard down there. Um, probably we'll end up with a couple of inches of real dry, powdery snow. It's about... It is. It's six degrees. My Dick Tracy watch just told me that. Six degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? Come on, Google. Google. Google that. Google. What do we do before Google? Life. It's like I said, Jr. life is about formulas, right? 14.4 Minus 14, yeah, minus 14 Celsius outside. That sounds colder than it is. And there's one, there's, there's one temperature in the Celsius versus the Fahrenheit scale. None of the temperatures match except one. And I think it's like, it's either 37 or 47 below. That on both scales, if it's, I'm going to say 47 below, I may be wrong. But on 40, if it's 47 below Fahrenheit, it's also 47 below Celsius. And it's the only time those two temperature scales match. The only time. Now, I don't know why they cross paths at that temperature. It has to do with... Formulas. What did I say? Yeah, 66. That'd be pretty cool. But anyway, so six degrees is pretty cold. Um, it'll, that's probably not the low. The wind's out there howling. Of course, our friends up in Michigan, the other coolies, were complaining that it was like minus 40 up there. That's the temperature, not the wind chill. Yeah, that yeah, it doesn't matter. You don't. Yeah, it's hard to hard to go outside. This is about how it was the first time I went to Fargo. Okay, and they said, "Welcome to Fargo." And I went, "All right." Anyway, First Peter chapter four. I'm glad that uh, I, we actually told a lot of people to stay home. Sister Linda Carmichael was back in town. She was going to come tonight. She said no, and several others. The parking lot's kind of slick, and it's cold out there, and we just don't. Recommended a lot of churches in the area closed down, and, uh, but we're still here, praise the Lord. First Peter chapter 4, uh, the last verse in chapter 4, but let me read down to it to get some context. In fact, let's start in verse 15, and that way verse 19 will make a little bit of better sense. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come, I talked about this last Wednesday night, the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? I had some people tell me that they were mad at me for preaching what I preached last Wednesday night. Me first. Because they weren't really mad. They were just saying that they didn't like having to think about how they were dealing with other people and treating other people and judging other people. And they had to judge themselves first. But that was the purpose of it, to make us feel just a little bit guilty before God. Amen? That's healthy for us. Verse 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now remember, as we get verse 19, that 
Paul tells us in, at the beginning of chapter 4 that our, our godly suffering has a cause, it has a reason. God justifies our suffering for Him. Now, again, you can suffer for what you did wrong, which you had it coming. Or you can suffer for what you didn't do wrong. You did something right and devils jumped on you, crucified you, persecuted you, tormented you, tried you, uh, sifted you as wheat, Jesus said. They'll do that and when that happens, we're to glorify God because God allowed it, number one, God allowed Peter and John to get beat by the Sanhedrin. They were preaching Jesus. The Sanhedrin pulled them in, said, we told you not to preach in this name anymore. And they said, well, whether that's from God or not, we're just going to obey God. And they beat them and they turned them loose. And they said, don't preach in Jesus' name no more. And they walked out of there happy that they had been found worthy to suffer that persecution for the sake and the cause of Jesus Christ. They were happy. Listen, when you compare any suffering that you have in this world, when you compare that to what you could have in hell, you, uh, it should make you happy. Should make it, you know what, I'm glad to have this and not hellfire on me. So when, when it comes to suffering, that's what he's saying. You could let, don't suffer as an evildoer or a busybody or a thief or murderer or anything like that. Don't, don't suffer that way because then you're just getting what you had coming. But if you suffer for doing right, happy are ye. Verse 19, what I was going to preach was committing ourselves to God. Letting God have our life. That's what I was going to preach. And God said, I got something else in mind. So verse 19, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto, and I want you to look at that, a faithful creator. A faithful creator. Father, I, I pray your blessing, Lord, on the teaching tonight. Uh, Father, I, I believe, Lord, that it was your idea, that that's the direction you wanted me to go in. And Lord, I was just, I was amazed because I thought that there wasn't going to be much scripture here. And there was, there was way more than what I may be able to get through tonight. And Father, I'm thankful for that. Lord, I want to, I want to tell people tonight that you're a very faithful God. And you make promises, God, that you keep. And I thank you for that. And Father, teach us that lesson. And teach us, God, that even though in this world, people are going to turn their backs on us. But you never will. You never have. And you never will. So, Father, open up our eyes to your word tonight. Teach us some good things. And we do ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Before I go through the scriptures, uh, maybe any of you five or six or seven can give me a how you think God is faithful. Or let's say in what areas of life do you know that God is faithful? Faithful, And the word faithful means it's like he abides with us and he says that I'm your God and you're my people and it's always going to be that way and it's never going to change and, and I'm still going to be your God and you're always going to be my child. So give me a way in which you know that God has exhibited his faithfulness to you. Yes, Alicia. Yeah. I talked about Isaiah 54, was it yesterday, maybe? But anyway, she said that she asked God years ago to be faithful in His mercy toward her. 
and she's still here. She's still serving the Lord, and God has, has been exactly that. He's been very faithful in his mercy to her. Somebody else, Aaron. Very good. I like that because you're not the only person, Aaron, in the world that has had to grow up without a dad, without a father. And some people are resentful of that. And when, you know, and I've had, I've heard some preachers say, well, you can't present God as a father because to them that's a bad thing. No, no, no. Introduce God as a father because he's the one that they never had. The fact that they had a bad father does not mean that they will always resent uh, be resentful towards somebody who tries to be a father to them They still have a desire in them to have a father figure that is faithful to them and my goodness He is, if you're born again. He's your father If you are that's why I was trying to teach Sunday if you are born again, he's your father So Aaron, I appreciate that. He's been a faithful father to you somebody else Melissa Yeah Where'd that $20 bill? I like doing that. Ne need money and you reach in and yeah. So she's saying that there's been times when she wanted to let go that God was basically holding on to her like this. Okay. And wouldn't let go. Because sometimes we don't, we don't have the strength to do it on our own. And God knows that. That's why he's stronger than we are. That's good. Anybody else? John. Uh, I used to have a lot of trouble with teaching, that sort of thing. Uh, and when I give up. <laughs> like with my teaching? You have a lot of trouble with my teaching? Is that what you're saying? Just learning and what to teach. Because that actually did help a lot. That used to be a lot. But uh, right at, when I'm in my worst, when I'm at my worst point where I'm like, I just don't want to do this, I don't like it, just all of a sudden I'll open the Bible. Boom. Sure he will. So when I'm not wanting to learn, he's teaching me even so. He never lets me stop learning. And uh, when I'm, it's at, just at the right time. I don't know how to explain it, but right. it's like, here, here's something for you. You know what I mean? I understand where you're here. Paul said this, For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that Day. Now that day is the day of our resurrection. The day when we won't need God to keep us anymore. We'll made it. Okay, we will have made it through. We crossed the finish line. We crossed Jordan. But until that time, Paul had the confidence of knowing. Of, and this is where we get this idea of what they call a no-so salvation. Are you, how do you know you're saved? Well, I just know so. I know that I'm saved. And that does it, that's not any arrogance on our part. It's not saying that we're going to make it no matter what, that we're going to survive, that we're strong enough. That's not what that means. It means that God is going to carry us through and we have committed our, and that's what he says in him. We commit the keeping of our souls to him in well-doing as into a faithful creator. So I guess in a way I am teaching this idea of committing to God, but it's with the idea that once we give it to God, God will never let go of us. Let me share something with you. Uh, there's been a show on A&E where they've been studying Scientology. Well, this last year, as part of that study, they got into the Jehovah's Witness cult. And they, were, and the, they brought in a, a whole group of people that had come out of Jehovah's Witness. And they said, take Scientology and add 8 million members and you've got Jehovah's Witness. Because it's larger than Scientology, and it, but it's the same kind of cult. And to hear these people's testimony, I mean, you just, I never really knew the depths to which the, Jeho the Watchtower Society, the grip that it had on those people's lives. And it, they, were, they were so... Uh, Jehovah's Witness people 
Basically, they sold out to everything in this world except a 100% dedication to Jehovah without the possibility of failure. And you could be discommunicated or thrown out for anything, for anything. If you had a family member that used to be a Jehovah's Witness and they were thrown out, you are absolutely forbidden from even talking to them ever again. If it's your son, if it's your daughter, if it's your mom and daddy, it doesn't matter. You're not supposed to communicate with them in any way, shape or form. And there was one lady, young lady, she got thrown out of her house by her mom and dad. She was 22 years old. All she knew was the Jehovah's Witness cult. They were her family. Her mom and daddy kicked her out. She had nothing. She had to go to a homeless shelter. 22 years old, had to go to a homeless shelter because nobody, all the people that she knew were forbidden from even talking to her. They couldn't give her money. They couldn't let her borrow a car because if they did, they also would be thrown out. And it was all the, see that religion is all about how much you have to do for God. Jesus comes to set us free. And it's about how much he has done for us is this religion and this church. Somebody say amen. And I, I, my, I, I was watching that last night and I'm just going, good gracious alive. Even the thing about blood transfusion. They will let you die instead of getting a blood transfusion of any kind. Because Jehovah forbids that. No, the Grand Council forbids that. And what the Grand Council says goes. And when they say you can't have blood transfusion, you have to watch your son or your daughter die in order to please Jehovah. That's wicked. That is wicked. So it's, this is not about how much we can do for Jehovah. This is all about how much He does for us. Amen? So that's why when I commit my soul and my life to God, I, it's because I already know what he's going to do with it. I know he's going to keep it. I absolutely know he's going to keep it. He's a, faith, he's a faithful creator. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Let me show you this. I like this. The Bible calls him the faithful God. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Here you go. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you. And see, that's it. When you love somebody, do you love them enough to let them make a mistake every now and then? If you don't, you don't love them. God set his love on Israel. He said, I didn't pick you because you're the biggest tribe, the most people, or the best. But I chose you because I loved you. Okay? Because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God. Underline that in your Bible. He's not a faithful God. He is the faithful. You know what that means? There is no other God that's faithful. No other God. The devil will hang you every time. And the devil's people will hang you every time. Somebody say amen. Which keepeth, he is the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and Elisha mercy. He keepeth mercy with them that, what? Love him. You love God? He'll keep His mercy for you. He'll keep His covenant with you, with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Now, I'm going to illustrate something for you. Keeping the commandments, okay? Uh, Spencer, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to come over to you. 
And I'm going to try to get your Bible from you. Okay? Whatever you do, don't let go of it. Got it? Give me that Bible. Give it here. No, seriously, give it here this time. I changed my mind. Give it to me. Come on. Come on. Everybody's looking. See? Camera's on you. Almost got it. Did you keep them? All right. Keeping the commandments means don't let them go. Don't let your Bible go. Don't let the devil take, your, take his God's word away from you. You kept them. Now, I also know that it means you live by them. They're, they're your life. I get that. But keeping means keeping them. This is our book. There, we don't have another book. There will never be another book. There will never be another set of instructions to us. This is it. This is the covenant that God made with us. I'm not about to try to work out a different covenant with God. I like the one that I've got. Because that one, I know God will be faithful and he will keep it. So I'll keep it. That's what he means. Keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. By the way, quit worrying about what everybody else does wrong. God will take care of them. Amen? Listen, God will either judge him or he'll save him. Now, which one do you want? But sometimes, sometimes, amen? But the thing here is, he is the faithful God. There is no other faithful God. He is the only faithful God. All the other gods are going to be unfaithful to you. Always. They'll always be unfaithful to you. Now, I like this. Let me read through some of these. Psalm 119, 86. All thy commandments are faithful. How many? Well, what about... 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. What about that one? 1 John 5, 7. Go look it up. Does God keep that one? 1 John 5, 7. You know what that one is? Huh? Yeah. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Lord, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That one went missing. Out of the new, new Bibles, the new modern translations, that verse, that whole verse is gone. The whole verse disappeared. Well, I thought God was going to keep all of those. Not according to the New Testament committee. They said that one slipped in later, so they took it back out. But God said he would keep all of his commandments. They persecute me wrongfully, help thou me. Verse 138, thy testimonies that thou hast commanded me are righteous and very faithful and what did we say that meant they're true they're, they'll never leave us meaning let's say that when you were a child you memorized a verse out of an NIV and that was 40 years ago you go to that same verse now they changed it three times since then well, they updated it, made the language, made it more particular to the Greek. That's not faithful. That's change. Thy testimonies are very faithful. It means God will never take them away. They'll always be there for us. Every, and so all you... Um, boy, I'm going to get mean here. All you Scott Johnson fans... He fell for the Mandela effect, which says that somebody went back in time and did something and took verses or words or changed words out of the King James Bible. So now in this alternate universe, our, our King James Bibles are not right in several places. Then that makes God a liar because God said that his word would always be faithful. Proverbs 14, 5 says, a faithful witness will not lie. Amen? 
A faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. So what is your Bible? Is it a faithful witness or is it a false witness? Which is it? And if your Bible says one thing that's not true, what does that make it? A lie, not true. Um, I Titus chapter 1, the qualifications for us pastors, bishops. A bishop must be blameless, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality. I was going to say a lover of hospitals. If you're going to be a pastor, you got to like hospitals. A lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, and then he is holding fast the faithful word. That means when you try to come and get my Bible, I'll pop you. I'm not walking away from the Bible ever again. I did it once. And I didn't like me back then. Okay? I did not like who I was then. I was not a good person. So my responsibility is to hold fast what? The faithful Bible, not the unfaithful one. I let that one go. But the faithful Bible, the one that they can't change, the one that, that I know that they're not going to change, that's the one I'm holding on to. As he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Revelation 21, 5, look at this. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. faithful. Revelation 22, 6, he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and True, and the Lord God of the holy prophets and his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. So you got two places in the book of Revelation that tells you that the words of the book of Revelation, I would say the words of the Bible, are both true and they are faithful. They have not been altered, have not been changed. And I've, I, I, believe it or not, somebody that says they follow me a, a couple years ago, we got into it via... Facebook Messenger, because he insisted that the mark of the beast was actually, I'd have forgot what number he'd come up with, and I went, well, it says right here, 603 score and 6. He said, well, you can believe that man's teaching all you want to, but this is from God. And I'm going, it's in the Bible. I don't know what I had, and I just said, you know what, you can accuse me, you can call me whatever name you want to, I'm not buying it, I know what the number is, it says it right here in plain English, it's in my Bible, my Bible's not wrong, so I'm just going to believe the Bible. People, people argue about the stupidest, silliest, they think they're right, and when you give them scripture, they're still right, no matter what. Faithful, I like this. I, I'm just going to read these, there's four places in your Bible where it calls, it refers to a faithful saying. 1 Timothy 1.15, 1 Timothy 4.9, 2 Timothy 2.11, Titus 3.8. This is a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. It is a faithful saying. This is a faithful saying. And what that means is that what's written in your Bible is faithful. Now, put the two together. God is a faithful God. He swore that he would not ever leave. Jesus, now think about, think about meanings. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And yet he left. Was he lying? No. He sent the comforter and he sent his word. He completed it and we have it. And as far as Christ goes, he is here. He's right here. He is as, this book is as faithful as God is faithful. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, I mean, this, I go back to Psalm 119. The commandments are faithful. The commandments are very faithful. They're a faithful witness. They're the faithful word. They are true and faithful. Faithful and true. It is the faithful saying, faithful saying, faithful saying, faithful saying. Alicia, you need to, me and you need to work on a song. A faithful saying, faithful saying, faithful saying, faithful saying. 
faithful saying, saying I know, something like that. Okay? So when you need, and this gets down to the whole Bible translation issue, the fact that the King James has remained unaltered since 1611 is its own witness. How long has your Bible been around? A couple years. How long has your Bible been around? 400 and some odd. Four, over 400, be 408 years this year that this Bible has remained faithful. It's been, they've tried to alter it. That didn't work out too well. They tried to revise it. That didn't work. One cult after another despises its words, tries to change them to suit their own false doctrine. People are still doing it all over the world and all over the internet, and yet the King James Bible still stays exactly the same as it was for the last 408 years. Turn, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Five, four, three, two. God said, I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Was Aaron 100% faithful to God in everything that he did? No. What about Aaron's sons? Were they 100% faithful in what they did? No, they got booted out because they offered strange fire. The priest and the high priest of even Samuel. We have Eli who is the high priest at the time Samuel is born. Eli was not faithful because he led his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, fornicate with all the women that came to the tabernacle and stole their food, stole their sacrifices from them. And God held Eli accountable for it. And then Samuel, lo and behold, he does the same thing. He doesn't do wrong, but his sons turn out wicked. They destroy his reputation. God judges Samuel because of it. And Samuel became the last judge of Israel. So that's when Saul became king. But one after another of the priests of Israel, t until finally, in, we studied this last week, in Ezekiel chapter 8, we find the elders and the priests inside the temple offering sacrifices to abominable idols. Remember that? Because judgment begins at the house of God. That's what God was showing Ezekiel. Let me show you what's going on inside the house of God. So they did not have a faithful priest. Think about the Roman Catholic priests who swear an oath saying that they're going to be celibate for the rest of their life, and yet, are they? Not a one. Not a one has been celibate. Okay? They're not faithful uh, to the Word of God. They're not faithful even to their own order's rules. They violate their own Religious orders, rules. They are not faithful priests. And I understand the idea of a lot of lost people who will not go to any organized church ever again because they saw the corruption of the clergy. And they said, I'm not going back. But that's not who leads our religion. The one in charge of our church or our religion is not a pope. It's not a bishop somewhere. It's not a general council somewhere. It's not a council of prophets. It's not a privy council. It's not anything like that. The one who is in charge of our religion is Jesus Christ, and he's a faithful priest. Amen. Hebrews 2, 17, Where in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. 
The only priest actually qualified to make reconciliation for our sins is Jesus. He's a faithful high priest, meaning he's not going to steal part of your sacrifice. He's not going to steal part of your stuff. He's not going to take advantage of you. Christ, I mean, when you, if you watch this thing about the Jehovah's Witness, it will dawn on you that the Jehovah's Witness organization is, is the exact same as probably any organized crime syndicate in this country. They hold absolute power over their people by way of religion and take their money. They take their money and they hold power over those people so that those people live or die at their command. While the men at the top get to do basically whatever they want to do because they're the esteemed counsel of God and they can do no wrong. Do you think that God, do you, do you think, let me just throw this at you. Do you think, Todd, that the upper management of the Jehovah's Witness denomination, the Watchtower Tract Society, are holy, pious men who are serving God the best way they know how? I think they're drunkards. I think they have eyes full of adultery. I think some of them are probably perverts. I think some of them are greedy of filthy, probably all of them are greedy of filthy lucre. They act holy and pious as the ones who tell everybody else how to live, but they themselves won't do it. That is spiritual wickedness in high places. And people follow that junk. Hebrews chapter 3, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. That's our, see, our denomination is this one, Jesus. It's our profession. We only, we only have one head. And it's not the Pope. And it's not a divine council in New York City somewhere, or Nashville, Tennessee, or Springfield, Missouri, or wherever else these denominations are headquartered. Our headquarters are in heavenly Jerusalem. He is the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. And think about this. He was faithful to him that appointed him. Jesus is the one who swore in Hebrews 10 that he would do it by the book. Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written to me to do thy will, O God. You know what one of the biggest heresies of Reverend Sun Myung Moon was? He actually believed that he was sent by God to complete the work that Jesus left unfinished because Jesus failed at Calvary. He said that Jesus failed by letting them kill him at Calvary. And so Sung Myung Moon, this Korean man who actually has the Guinness World Record for the largest wedding ceremony, over a thousand couples or something like that, got married all at once by him. Yeah, wow, big deal, right? But he believed that Jesus failed at Calvary and that God had ordained him to... to Fix the failure that Jesus made at Calvary. I don't know what he was supposed to be doing, but yeah, I have no idea what it was, but that's what I heard. But according to the Bible, oh no, Jesus was faithful to him that appointed him. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. No more, no less. Amen? Amen. Uh, Jeremiah 42, 5. Then they said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not even according to all things which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Now I want to throw something in here for you. There's always going to be times when there's disagreements between people. Always. I have friends in the ministry who are good friends. 
I love them. If they asked me to do anything, I would do it for them. Anything that I could do, I would do for them. But I don't think I agree with them in everything. And I know people who they think that they're so right, they feel like they're called of God to go straighten everybody out, including their best friends and their family members. Straighten everything out, because I'm right and you're obviously wrong. And I don't do that to my friends. If there's something, let's say Mike Hutzel, Mike, I love Mike, I would do anything for him just like that. And I know Mike loves the Bible like I do, he studies it, but you know, he's a different man than I am. He sees things maybe differently. So let's say this not ever happened, but let's say Mike came up with something that when I heard it, I just didn't, it doesn't sound right to me. And I've had people try to provoke me to go after my friends. I've had people try to provoke me and challenge me and say, well, you know they're wrong. Why don't you go, why don't you go and, and call them out on that? All they're trying to do is stir up. They're trying to sow discord. And they're all women, by the way. Okay? I would never do that. I would go to God and say, God, you're my judge and you're his judge. And God, I'm going to let you be a true and faithful witness between us both. And God, if I'm wrong, you either correct me or give me grace. And God, if they're wrong, you either correct them or you give them grace even where they're wrong. Because I'm not going to be right in everything I say or believe. There's no way in the world. And it's a fallacy for any man of God to assume that he has the right way and everybody else can be damned in his sight because they don't believe the way he does. I don't like treating people that way. And I think that between family, brothers and sisters, friends, if something rises up and it's, you're not going to agree. Won't you let God deal with it? Let God be a faithful witness. Because God knows the sum of their life. And God knows the sum of my life. He knows everything about us. And I just let God handle it. See, even if I'm terribly wrong. I've got enough confidence in God. That it, when he corrects me, he'll do it in love. He, I, I mean, I'm not talking about like the prophets of Baal versus Elijah kind of stuff. I'm talking about just things we don't see eye to eye on, things we don't agree on. Okay? There are King James Bible pastors out there that I think are in terrible error on certain issues. I don't go after them. You know why? King James Bible. There are not very many of us left. Amen. And the devil would love to get us at each other's throat. I'm going to move on from this, but let the Lord be a true and faithful witness between everybody. Because he'll be good at it. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Turn there. Verse 4. I thank my God always in your behalf. You catch up when you get there. For the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall conf Watch this now, because this ties in right with 1 Peter 4. Who shall also confirm you unto the end. See, I like words. I, think, I like how they're built. Confirm is con and firm. Con means with, firm means... Stability. That's what it means. God will give you stability and confirm you unto the end. This is why I say that true believers, those who are truly born again, remain faithful. 
They start out believing and they die believing. Do you know why? God confirms them. God is the one who keeps them stable and, and uh, static and unmovable and unchangeable. And once they get this idea that the Bible's right, they finish that way. And I'm not going to say they have to. I'm saying they're going to. God confer- You know, God doesn't just say, okay, I wrote your name down. I hope you make it. Listen, if God wrote my name down, it's because he knows I already have. Who shall confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless. See, that's it right there. That you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By whom you were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you're worried that the new world order is going to kick in. And the Chris are going to come get all our guns, right? And they're going to come after our Bibles. And they're going to close down all our churches. And you're worried about the globalism and the New World Order and the Illuminati and all the conspiracy. You're worried about all that. And you're worried about whether you're going to make it. Listen, if God wrote your name down, you're going to make it. Okay? I'm just saying that's... That's how he does it. When you take that which is most precious to you, which is your soul, and you give that to God, you are committing it to God. Of course, if you give it to God, he's not going to stand there and then wait for you to prove your worth. Um, Or, what am I trying to say? You commit that over to God, God's not going to kick that back on you and say, well, I'm going to give it back and I'm, going to, I'm just going to see whether you're worthy or not. You committed it to God. He's got it. He's going to hang on to it. Amen. He's going to keep it. Okay? God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There is no temptation taken you but such is common to man, but God is faithful. How many times is that in your Bible? Something like, I don't know, eight times, something like that. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be, may be, may be able to bear it. God is faithful. He knows what you can and can't do. He already knows that. He's faithful. He's not, he is so faithful to you, He's not going to allow you to go through some temptation that he knows there's no way out of it. That, that's what that means. God, oh, God didn't say you'll be able to hold up to the temptation. He says, in the temptation, I'm going to make a way of escape for you. And God just knows what to do with you. God is faithful in that. 1 Thessalonians 5. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Who, who are we expecting to do this? Are we, and I like, I like how Brother Kelly put it. There is election and free will. Some say it's all election. Some say it's all free will. And I think the Bible says it's both. A train runs on two tracks and those two rails go the same place. Free will and God's election, one is always based on the other. God chose you. Because of his foreknowledge in knowing that you would also choose him. But you chose him because God elected you. Now we're right back here, but then we're back here again, but then we're back here again. Right? Are you confused? It's both of them. Okay? Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. But... You're the one who committed, look at that. Your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Is God, do you believe in preservation? Yes. Do I believe in perseverance? Yes. 
There's nothing in the Bible that says it's one, not the other. In fact, when you honestly, when you honestly read the whole of the scriptures, you see both. You see both because they're both there and they're both part of it. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Look at that. All men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you. There's another one. And keep you from what? Evil. Now, does that mean God will never let you sin? No, but I'll tell you this. The really bad ones that you could have done, he kept you from them. Okay? He kept you from them. And we know there is the evil day coming, don't we? The evil day. God is going to keep his saints in that evil day. He's going to keep them. He's going to do it supernaturally. He's going to, he's going to, and he's going to get all the praise and glory for it, but he's going to do it. Okay. Hebrews, t boy, I got, how much more do I got? I'm almost done. Yeah, almost done. So can I finish? Hebrews 10, that was good enough. Your silence is consent. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. See, here it is. Let us hold fast, fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Look at it. Here you have free will, perseverance, and you have election, preservation in the same verse. Let us hold fast our profession of faith, for he is faithful that promised. And what he means by that is that his word still doesn't lie, does it? His word still doesn't lie. And you're going to, you are, remember that thing about the Bible I was going to try to take away from you? You're going to hang on to that, aren't you? You're going to keep it. You're not going to let anybody, it's kind of, it, Chris, it's kind of like us with our guns. Okay? When they say, hand over your guns. Ain't happening. Hand over your Bibles then. That ain't happening. Okay? And there's just enough people in this country and in this world who are not going to turn their back on the Word of God. Let us hold fast at the profession of our faith without wavering. 1 John 1, 9, if we can look at this. Salvation. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. God is faithful. Now, how many times, though, will God forgive your sins? What if you commit the same sin twice? Or five times? Or 489 times? I mean, 490 times is a lot of sins in one day. I don't know if anybody's ever got there. So I think that pretty much covers it. I mean, we could say that, yeah, God has a limit, but it's a high limit and nobody's ever got there yet. Okay. God, I, when I, when I talk to people about salvation, I read this verse. I said, these are two legal terms. Faithful means as in a contract. If God swore an oath to you in a contractual form, God is going to be faithful to that contract and not ever violate it. But God is also judicially just in that not even God can break his own laws. I mean, they say God can do everything, right? Can God make a weapon that can kill God? That's a stupid question. Can God make a law that he can break? That also is the same kind of stupid question. God is... His nature is that he is judicially just and he doesn't break his law. If he said he's going to forgive you, he's going to forgive you. 
Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 3, he's the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And then Revelation 19, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called what? Faithful. So Jehovah's Witness that are listening, is it Jesus that's faithful or is it God that's faithful? Which one is the faithful God? It's both. They're not different. They are the same. That's it. I'm done. He's called faithful and he's called true. And in this same context, he is the word of God, meaning the word of God is always true and the word of God is always faithful. You see, the word of God, guys, is that friend that for a while you didn't talk to him. You didn't commune with him. But you got to missing him. And when you went back, you found out that he was still there waiting for you to come back. He never left. Your Bible was the same Bible the way you left it. Amen? He's faithful. And he's true. And then that whole idea, I don't know if I'll preach it next week or not, this one, this way it, it turned out the idea was the same. When you commit it to God, you have confidence in knowing that God is not going to forsake what you committed to Him. Okay? It's like the banks. They, nobody trusts, the old timers didn't trust banks. That's why the government started insuring all the deposits so that if the banks went bad, you were insured. You're going to get your money back no matter what. God is a lot better than any bank. Amen. He's faithful.